The Iberian connection or the constructing the Salutrian solution. Clovis was first found in the 30s. Uh, this is the Clovis projectile point right here. Uh, it is recognized because of its distinctive flute. Can, can you see this? Do, 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 do. That's a flute. Uh, those occur on both sides of the projectile point and it's flaked on both sides. In other words, it's what archaeologists call a biface artifact, a bifacial artifact. Most of the Paleolithic archaeology in the whole world is unifacial. In other words, large flakes and blades that are dressed up on one side only and minimally on the other side. There are several cultures, Paleolithic cultures, that do bifacial technology. Almost everybody in the New World Salutrian in Europe and Silesian in Eastern Europe. Other than that, you get a little bit of bifacial technology post Clovis throughout Siberia. This claim has been going strong in Eurocentric circles for quite some time. Now that Smithsonian curator Dennis Stanford has joined forces with American stone napper Bruce Bradley. While Stanford has received much media press, as do most these outlandish claims, not many are aware that most of the foundations of this already toppling theory have been thoroughly debunked. This is a case of a scientist who just cannot let go of his theory, and therefore willfully ignores the evidence against him. I quote from Lawrence Guy Strauss, David Meltzer's and Ted Goebel's study, Ice Age Atlantis? Exploring the Solatrian Clovis connection. The Solatrian technology, with its mastery of the, often bifacial, production of a variety of elegant foliate, shouldered and stem points, has long seduced modern nappers and Paleoindian archaeologists and aficionados in America, who think they see unique similarities between Clovis projectile points and those of this supposedly distinctive European culture. European prehistorians are usually far less convinced of the uniqueness of the Solnitrian, being familiar as they are with a large number of other techno-complexes of both upper and middle Paleolithic age that produce leaf points by invasive retouch, not only in Western but also in Central and Eastern Europe, and even in Africa. The archaeological crux of Bradley and Stanford's argument is that there are supposedly amazingly similar artifact technologies, which are said to be alike down to minute details of typology and manufacture technology between Clovis and Solitrian. We will leave aside for the moment the fact that, given the temporal gap involved, attention ought to be on similarities between Solitrian and pre-Clovis, not Solitrian and Clovis. Bradley and Stanford admit this, but subsequently largely ignore the point. Like others before them such as Hibben and Greenman, in comparing the so-called Sandia points with Solitrian shouldered points, Bradley and Stanford focused particularly on apparent similarities between Clovis and Solitrian lithic technologies in blade and projectile production and typology. We remain profoundly skeptical of the claim for a Solitrian colonization of North America and believe there are far more reasonable and parsimonious alternative explanations for the relatively few formal similarities that can be argued to exist between these temporally and spatially remote cultural manifestations. Notably, the well-known phenomenon of adaptive technological convergence or parallelism. Dennis Stanford forgot to mention that bifacial lithic technology has existed since humankind arose. In fact, since before humankind existed, we can see bifacial technology go as far back as Homo erectus in Africa in the Acheulean which was 1.65 million years ago to about 100,000 years ago. Bifacial technology has arisen independently at different times. And if we need to look to some other place, well pre-Clovis bifacial points have just been found in the Shandong region of China where they state that the Upper Paleolithic was much more complicated than thought and they have found some fluted bifacial points. This is Upper Paleolithic which is not post-Clovis. Moreover, out, there isn't much in Siberia that even looks like Clovis. Back 30,000 years ago, people who made wedge-shaped cores where they struck microblades off of these micro cores, sectioned them into straight pieces and used an osseous material. Uh, in this case, it's uh, a bison scapula, but ivory or antler, they would slot it and then the uh, straight pieces would be uh, inserted into the slot and these represented both projectile points and knives. This is a totally different technological adaptation to weaponry than Clovis.
Bradley and Stanford make much of the fact that Clovis lacks microblades used in composite, inset weapons, while early Siberian and Alaskan techno complexes do have microblades. This is supposedly evidence against a Northeast Asian origin for Clovis. Yet, the matter is much more complicated than they portray. Small blades have been recovered from the Galt Clovis site, the Shoop, Pennsylvania, Fluted Point site and the pre-Clovis age sites of Cactus Hill, Virginia, and Meadowcroft, Pennsylvania. Indeed, it was based in part on those forms that Shoop's original investigator envisioned a historical technological connection to Northeast Asia. Yet, these small blades are otherwise rare in Clovis and Clovis-like assemblages. Moreover, the Solatrian side of this equation is not as Bradley and Stanford envision either. Solatrian excavations often contain large numbers of backed bladelets. For example, in some of the Solatrian levels at La Riera Cave, Asturias, Spain, back bladelets make up between 10 and 24 percent and even 71 percent of retouched artifact assemblages normally totaling 100 to 200 pieces. And the same is true for Solatrian assemblages from Amalda and Eight Spatyart 4 in the coastal Basque country, Cuevas Shufan, and Morin, in Cantabria, as well as Ambrosio and Parpaio caves in Mediterranean Spain, La Malpas and Comsonier rock shelters in Dordogne, among others. Of course, the appearance of small blades is hardly necessary evidence of a historical relationship, as they appear in the prehistoric record all over the world at different times. As for bifaces, Bradley and Stanford report that unifacially flaked points comprise just under half of the Solnitrian concave base points. In contrast, unifacially flaked points are completely absent from the large sample of Texas Clovis points and rare virtually everywhere else across North America. Those few specimens that do occur appear to have been hastily made expedient forms. The almost universal bifacial nature of Clovis points highlights an obvious technological difference in primary reduction between them and Solatrian forms. Moreover, Clovis points are almost always fluted on both faces. Again, to give a specific example, 92% of 421 Texas Clovis points for which data are available are fluted on both faces. Solatrian points of course, are not fluted. And where in Clovis or pre-Clovis for that matter are the stem points and corner notched points of the Iberian Solatrian, which are frequent not only in Mediterranean Spain, but also in Portugal. Where the Solatrian culture is at its closest to the United States east coast, a mere 5,600 kilometers. Further still, where are the shouldered points, of which there are many types in the French, Spanish and Portuguese Solatrian? none of which look like the so-called Sandia points.